Good afternoon, my name is Teresa, and I would like to welcome you to the 27th webinar in the Rus Copernicus webinar series. This month we will look at the freshwater quality monitoring using Sentinel-2 optical satellite and SNAP toolbox. First, quick overview of today's webinar. We will start with the Rus service introduction, then we will move on to the introduction to water quality monitoring using optical data, then we will move on to a quick introduction of the Sentinel-2 satellite, and then to the exercise, and finally to Q&A session. The entire webinar should take approximately one and a half hours, and it will be completely recorded, and soon available on YouTube and rus-training.eu. Now let's go to the Rus service introduction. Rus stands for Research and User Support for Sentinel Core Products, and it is an initiative funded by the European Commission and managed by the European Space Agency. The main objective of the initiative is to promote the uptake of Copernicus Sentinel data and support R&D activities. The service provides free and open scalable platform in a powerful computing environment, hosting a suite of open source toolboxes, which are pre-installed on virtual machines. These allow you to handle and process the data derived from Sentinel satellites. So what do I mean? Well, with the large amount of data produced by the Sentinel satellites every day, the challenge is no longer the data availability, but rather the storage and processing capacity. To solve that, RUS offers virtual machines so that you have the appropriate computing environment to handle the data. But in addition to those, RUS also provides a specialized user help desk to which you can address any questions relating to Sentinel data, their processing or selection and dedicated training program, such as, for example, this webinar, face-to-face -face events or e-learning. So let's move on to the RUS websites, where you can find all the details. The first one contains all the information about the project, and it is where you can register for the service and access your virtual machine. The second contains all the information about the training activities we organize, such as, for example, this webinar, you have also registered there. And finally, we also have our YouTube channel where you can find all the previous recorded webinars. Now let's move on to the introduction to water quality monitoring. Water quality monitoring is the process of determining the chemical, physical and biological characteristics of water bodies and identifying the possible contamination sources that degrade the quality of water. Degradation of the quality of water resources may result from the base discharges, pesticides, heavy metals, nutrients, microorganisms or sediments, and not all the water quality parameters can be measured by remotely sensed data. It is however a useful tool to complement in-situ data sampling and laboratorial analysis, as these are usually laborious and expensive and thus spatially and temporally limited. First let's have a look on the image on the right side. It shows the various complex interactions of the incoming solar irradiance with the water body and adjacent land areas. The radiance measured by sensor is a sum of radiation reflected and scattered by the water volume, water surface, lake bottom, atmosphere and adjacent areas respectively. These are also dependent on the transmittance of the atmosphere or, in other words, the portion of radiation that propagates through the atmosphere. Each radiance component is a function of the measurement geometry, for example the solar and sensor angles, and the wavelength. Remote sensing of water bodies relies on spectral response from water volume in the visible and near-infrared part of the spectra, which is determined by so-called optically active constituents. These are, for example, chlorophyll A, A to the... These are, for example, chlorophyll A, total suspended matter, or in another words, suspended particular matter, and the colored dissolved organic matter. The sum of these constituents represent the inherent optical properties of a water body. Separation of these various contributors from the water leaving radiance allows to obtain a quantitative information on the water constituents, and for shallow water, also bathymetry and bottom substrate. Regarding the lake bottom, in optically deep water, the water surface, water body and water constituents are the main sources of radiation from within the lake. In optically shallow water, however, the water leaving radiance partly includes the radiation which has been reflected from the lake bottom. 
the water reading radiance then contains additionally to water constituents information of the bottom substrate and bathymetry. In small narrow lakes or the vicinity of the coast, the adjacency effect also influences the reflected light because the pixels are affected by the signal originating from surrounding land. Pixels from the coastline are brighter than water pixels and the multiple scattering hampers accurate derivation of water quality parameters. Finally, altogether, 90 to 98% of the signal obtained by a remote sensing sensor originates from the contributions of water surface and the atmosphere. Only the remaining 2 to 10% include a signal that is interesting for water quality remote sensing. This means that a good atmospheric correction is absolutely key for most constituent retrieval algorithms and we will discuss it in the next slide. As mentioned on the previous slide, about 90% of the signal that reaches the sensor is affected by absorption and scattering by different particles in the atmosphere, for example water vapor, ozone, oxygen and carbon dioxide and also aerosols. Atmospheric correction is therefore an essential procedure Atmospheric correction processors remove the scattered signal of the atmosphere and retrieve the signal from the water's surface as a water leaving reflectance. We cannot apply the same atmospheric correction to all water bodies, however. We can divide the water bodies to two main categories. Case 1 waters are mostly dominated by phytoplankton, whereas case 2 waters with different concentrations of optically active substances such as chlorophyll, sedum, and TSM are more complex when delivering water quality parameters. This is due to high and independent absorption of scattering by all the optically active constituents. For case 1 waters, atmospheric correction algorithms assume that the water leaving radiance is zero at near infrared part of the spectrum. This assumption, however, is not valid in turbid case 2 waters because of the scattering by particles that increase the water leaving reflectance in the near infrared part. This causes then overcorrection in the visible part of the spectra if case 1 atmospheric correction algorithms are applied to a case 2 water bodies. Number of different atmospheric processors have then been developed. Number of, atmos number of different atmospheric correction processors have been developed for this purpose, and there is an extensive literature on the performance and comparison. Number of different atmospheric correction processors have been developed for this purpose, and there is extensive literature on the comparison of their performance. For example, the publicly available atmospheric correction processors are Acolyte, C2RCC, iCore, I2Gen, Polymer, and Sentucore. If you wish to know more about these processors, you can check the source at the bottom of the page. Two of these are also available in SNAP. These are the Sentucore and the C2RCC. Centocore is by default intended for land applications and it is the atmospheric correction processor operationally applied to Sentinel-2 data to produce the level 2A data. It is built upon a scene classification and lookup tables from a radiance transfer model. Based on a recent study by Warren et al. From 2019, sent to core performed relatively poorly in the coastal waters, but performance improved for inland waters, suggesting that it's better suited to correct inland water bodies rather than coastal zones. The other algorithm, also available in SNAP and used in this exercise, is the Case 2 Regional Coast Color Processor. It is based on a multi-sensor per pixel artificial neural network method built upon previous atmospheric correction algorithms, the case to regional and coast color. The same study found that C2RCC processor performed best together with Polymer out of the tested algorithms for both inland and coastal waters. On the image, the evaluation statistics are shown. The coefficient of determination or R squared is high for C2RCC and the mean absolute percentage difference the root mean square difference and the mean relative difference are all low. On the image on the right, the evaluation statistics from this paper are shown. The coefficient of determination or R squared for C2RCC is very high and the mean absolute percentage difference, the root mean square error 
and the mean relative difference are low, confirming the good performance of C2RCC over inland and coastal waters. Once we complete the atmospheric correction, we can move on to obtain the quantitative information on water constituents such as suspended particulate matter, colored dissolved organic matter and phytoplankton or cyanobacteria. We need to separate the contributors from water leaving reflectance. We can divide the main methods into two categories, the empirical and the semi-analytical. Empirical approaches require in-situ measurement of the variable of interest, which serve as basis for establishing empirical relationship with the water leaving radiance measured in one or multiple sensor bands. The regression equation is then applied to every image pixel, providing a spatial depiction of the respective indicator. The setup of empirical models is relatively easy. Their application, however, is often limited to specific study site or a particular sensor. However, advanced semi-empirical algorithms, such as artificial neural networks, rely on large datasets of remote sensing and accompanying in-situ data. Using large parts of this database, the artificial neural network is trained to derive statistical relationship between remote sensing data and one or multiple optical constituents. Similar to empirical approaches, the remaining data serve as a validation basis to derive the performance criteria. One such semi-empirical method is included in the C2RCC processor. It does not only perform atmospheric correction, but also outputs inherent optical properties, chlorophyll A concentration, TSM concentration, and detritus or Gelbstoff absorption at 443 nanometers. It is based on a neural network technology and has been trained in extreme ranges of scattering and absorption properties. It also provides the possibility to add additional background information, such as salinity, elevation, ozone, temperature and air pressure, to further improve the results. Now let's move on to the description of the optically active constituents by themselves. First, let's start with chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is a major indicator of the trophic state because it acts as a link between nutrient concentration, particularly phosphorus, and algal production. On the image, you can see the modeled water reflectance spectra for chlorophyll concentrations of 0.1, 3, 30, and 300 milligrams per cubic meter, showing the fluorescence peak at 685 nanometers for lower chlorophyll concentrations, and the peak in wavelength range of 700 to 710 nanometers for chlorophyll concentrations above 100 milligrams per cubic meter. The colored bands in the image correspond to the Sentinel-2 bands. Chlorophyll A, while mainly reflecting green, absorbs most of the energy from wavelength in the violet and blue part of the spectra and orange and red part of the spectra. Narrow spectral bands are required for the measurement of chlorophyll A concentration and its spatial and temporal variances within the water body. In waters dominated by chlorophyll, estimation of the chlorophyll concentration is relatively straightforward. The blue and green two-band ratio model algorithms work most successfully because of the phytoplankton domination and its first absorption peak around 440 nanometers, or blue, and minimal absorption around 550 nanometers, or green part of the spectra. However, for case 2 waters, to which majority of inland water bodies belong, the situation is a little bit more complicated. Algorithms at blue and green wavelengths fail because of absorption and scattering due to colored dissolved organic matter and total suspended matter. A two-band near-infrared and red ratio model is widely used in this case, and it uses the red band located at the range of maximum chlorophyll absorption between 660 and 690 nanometers and the near-infrared band between 700 and 720 nanometers. For more turbid waters, a 3 and 4 band near infrared and red ratio models were developed and they attempt to minimize the effect of the total suspended matter absorption. Additionally, various so-called line height algorithms have been developed for detecting surface blooms and near surface vegetation in coastal and ocean waters. For example, the maximum chlorophyll index, which you can see on the slide, has been used successfully with chlorophyll A concentrations over 10 mg per cubic meter. As there is a very large number of algorithms that are routinely used, we will not address all of them here. 
But if you are interested, I would advise a paper from Asper and Alikas from 2018, where you can find an exhaustive overview. Now let's move on to the other optically active, active constituents. We have mentioned the color dissolve organic matter several times already. However, it is also called Gelbstoff or Gilvin and consists of naturally occurring water-soluble biogenic heterogeneous organic substances that are yellow to brown in color. These exist in both fresh and saline waters. These compounds are brown and can color the water yellowish-brown in high concentrations. Therefore, they are referred to as yellow matter or colored dissolved organic matter, and usually with a high chlorophyll A and TSS dominate the water color. Sedum absorbance spectrum can several times overlap the chlorophyll absorption spectrum, and it can account for over 50% of the total absorption at 443 nanometers, which is the wavelength that we usually use for chlorophyll extraction for case 1 waters. The increase in sedum concentration mainly affects the reflectance values in the blue and green region of the spectra, and this, in turn, can complicate the use of chlorophyll A retrieval algorithms and phytoplankton production models. Remote sensing of colored dissolved organic matter is important, mostly in studying aquatic ecology and carbon dynamics. The next optically active constituent that we will mention is turbidity and total suspended matter, or in other words, also suspended particulate matter. Water turbidity is an optical property of water which scatters and absorbs the light rather than transmitted in straight lines. Suspended sediments are responsible for most of the scattering, whereas the absorption is controlled by chlorophyll A and colored dissolved organic matter or particulate matter. Turbidity and total suspended matter are considered as important variables in many studies due to their linkage with incoming sunlight that in turn affects photosynthesis for growth of algae and phytoplankton. On the image, you can see absorption coefficients of clean water, sedum, phytoplankton, and non-algal particles. Again, the colored bands show the position of Sentinel-2 spectral bands. Other parameters measurable by remote sensing are, for example, total phosphorus, temperature, and dissolved oxygen. However, we will not address them in this tutorial. Now let's move on to the quick introduction of Sentinel-2 satellite. The Sentinel-2 mission consists of two twin identical satellites, Sentinel-2A and Sentinel-2B, which are placed in a polar orbit faced approximately 180 degrees to each other. They both carry an identical instrument with 13 spectral bands that supply data at three different resolutions. The visible and near-infrared wide band are supplied with 10 meter resolution, then the red edge bands and the shortwave infrared bands are supplied with 20 meter resolution, and the three so-called atmospheric bands are supplied with 60 meter resolution. The data are available at two levels, level 1c and level 2a. The level 2a data are atmospherically corrected, but both of the products are radiometrically and geometrically corrected and resampled to a common grid. They are also distributed as 100 by 100 kilometer tiles. Now let's move on to the exercise part. First, however, let's say a few words about the Trasimeno Lake, which will be the subject of today's study case. Trasimeno Lake is post-tectonic, shallow, turbid and eutropic lake in central Italy. At an average altitude of 257 meters, it is the fourth largest Italian lake, with a diameter about 11 kilometers and a perimeter about 53 kilometers. The lake is closed without a natural outlet and with a small watercourses and runoffs that feed the reservoir, resulting in long water renewal time. Lake water level is strongly dependent on meteorological conditions such as annual rainfall, and under current climate change scenario has recorded a significant reduction in water availability. The water column is unstratified with a recurrent sedimentary suspension due to wind action. The high nutrient availability favors the occurrence of phytoplankton blooms, including cyanobacteria species. The main anthropogenic pressures are related to agriculture and life livestock practices, to tourism and recreation activities. The lacustrine ecosystem is also an area of exceptional value for flora and fauna richness and species biodiversity. It is included in the Natural Regional Park and includes two Natura 2000 sites. 
Now to the exercise itself. Here on this slide you can see an overview flowchart of our processing. We will start with Sentinel-2 level 1c data, which we then pre-process by resampling and subsetting. Then we will apply atmospheric correction and bio-optical optically active constituents retrieval in the form of C2RCC algorithm. Afterwards, uh, we will use the water leaving reflectances resulting from the C2RCC operator to calculate indices for two empirical models, which will be the band ratio of red and near infrared and the maximum chlorophyll index at 740 nanometers. Then we will use in-situ data to calibrate our empirical models and apply those to extract the chlorophyll A concentration. So now let's move on to the virtual machine and start the exercise. First, let's have a look at our exercise folder and our downloaded data. I have placed my downloaded data to the original folder and we will be working with 12 images acquired between April 16th and November 15th of 2018. The images are not sorted by time due to the fact that we are using images from both Sentinel-2A and Sentinel-2B. So first step will be to open SNAP. Okay, here we can say finish as our application is up to date. And now let's have a look at our images. So to open our images in SNAP, we go to open product and navigate to the original folder and select one image that we want to show. We don't need to show all of them. So for example, let's select the image from the 22nd of August, 2018. We can use the zip file as the data are downloaded because SNAP can open the zip files without having to extract them. Now the open file will appear in the Product Explorer tab and we can have a look at its structure. In the structure of the file, you can see the acquisition date in the name. You can see the metadata folder, vector data folder, bands folder that contains the 13 spectral bands of Sentinel-2 and the mask folder. Let's open the RGB view. And here we first choose the natural colors view. So we can see our tile, um, it's 100 by 100 kilometers that I have already mentioned and our Trasimeno Lake is up here in the northern part of the tile. Now let's open another band combination which is the false color band combination. So again open RGB and we select the false color infrared. In this band combination we can have much better view on the water bodies as in near infrared almost all radiation is absorbed over water bodies. There we go. And to compare them next to one another, we can go to Windows and Tile horizontally. And then we can go to the Navigation tab to zoom to both images. There we go. So now we have both images in the two color combinations and we can zoom in to our area of Trasimeno Lake. There we go. So we can see that compared to other water bodies, for example, like uh, the lake down here, Trasimeno Lake appears very green in the natural color and it appears blue in the false color infrared. This suggests by basic visual analysis that there is high concentrations of chlorophyll and other optically active constituents. Now let's move on to the next step, which will be the pre-processing of the data. So as you have seen in the flowchart, first we need to start with the pre-processing, which includes resampling and subset of the data. We do not want to process the entire tile. We only wish to process the area of the lake. So to do this, we will use the snap command line tool, which is called GPT. But first we need to create a graph that, we, that will tell the GPT tool which steps to apply to our product. To create the graph, we can go to Tools and Graph Builder. So here at the moment, we have two operators, the read and the write operator. To add an additional operator, we right click on the white space, go to Add, Raster, Geometric, 
and resample. We first add the resample operator because many operators in SNAP cannot process multi-resolution data such as Sentinel-2 data. So first we resample and we connect the resample operator with the read operator. And the next step will be to add the subset operator. So again, I right click, go to add, raster, geometric and subset. and connect it with the resample operator and also with the write operator. Now at the same time, a tabs have appeared in the bottom where I can set my parameters for each of the operators. Here in this step, we will only set the parameters for the resample and subset operators and we will not pay any attention to the read and write operators at the moment. So let's click on resample. In the resample operator, you have three different options of how to resample the data. You can use a reference band from the source product, which will be our selected method. So here, if you have multi-resolution data, you can choose one of the bands of the original product to serve as a resampling model for, your, for the rest of your bands. If you remember correctly, um, when I was introducing the Sentinel-2 data, I was mentioning that bands 2, 3, and 4, and 8 are the 10 meter resolution bands, and we would like all our other data to be resampled also to 10 meter resolution. There we go. Here you will have the resulting target width and height in pixels. Then we can also use the by target width and height in pixels. So if we wish to uh, divide our image into specified number of pixels, we can do it using this method. Or we can set a specific pixel resolution. For example, if we do not want to have any of the resolutions that are currently present in the data, we can choose, for example, 100 meter resolution and resample um, the data to completely different resolution than the original data. Then in the bottom here, we define the resampling algorithms for upsampling and downsampling methods. For us, we will just use the default algorithms here. Then we will go to subset. In the subset operator, you have again two methods. You can either subset your product by, by bands, so you can only select the bands that you are interested in for further processing and discard all the other bands to decrease the size of the product. And you can also do a spatial subset using either the pixel coordinates or geographic coordinates. The pixel coordinates are usually only applicable either if you are subsetting only a single file or if you are using products, for example, like the Sentinel-2 products, which are already resampled to a common grid. It is, however, a good practice to use geographic coordinates anytime that you are processing a time series, as you can make sure that all your output products will have the same exact extent. So if I go to the geographic coordinates, I have a map here. I can click to zoom to my product and I will see the footprint of my product. I have two ways now how to select my subset. I can either zoom in and draw my polygon here. This is not very precise, of course, or I can create, I can pass a well-known text format polygon here. So how do you get the well-known text format? It's actually very easy. So you can draw the polygon on your image here. So I choose the drawing tool here. And I draw a polygon over my lake. There we go. Now, if I select the selection tool and right click on the polygon, I can choose well-known text or WKT from Geometry. And here is my well-known text polygon. I can copy this polygon and copy paste it in here. And you click update. And now the same polygon that I have defined here is also shown here on the image. I can zoom in closer There we go. So this is my subset. This is the size of the subset compared to the footprint of the entire image. Now, when we have set the parameters this way, we can save the graph. 
Why do I not uh, set any parameters in the read and write operator? At the moment, the product that is loaded is used by default. This is because I wish to apply the same graph to all the products and I therefore need to change them at every run. So let's just click save to the graph and let's save it into the processing folder as for example my graph.xml. So now I can close the graph and I can minimize snap and now let's go to the folder So my graph has been saved here as an XML file. Let's first open it to just have a, to just have a look. So I will open it with a mouse pad because that is an editable format or editable uh, way to open it. So here you can see the XML file structure. Each operator consists is enclosed in a node. So here, for example, this is the node for the read operator which contains the name of the operator and all the input parameters. So for example, here, the input parameter is a file and it is the file that was loaded to snap. So therefore selected as the input. Then we have the resample node here, again, enclosed between node ID and node and all the parameters. So we chose a reference band, band number two and all the other parameters. We continue again with subset node, which starts here and it's here. And here we have the polygon that we have selected to subset our product by. And finally, the write operator is here. Here, the bottom part is only for when you open the uh, graph in the graphical interface of Snap. And it basically um, defines the position of the squares of the operators within the graph. So it's not really important for us at this moment. Now we need to apply a couple steps. As I've mentioned before, we will be using the GPT version of Snap. So let's first say a few words on what the GPT is. The GPT is a command line version of Snap. So let's open a command line or terminal emulator first. If you install Snap, the GPT should be automatically installed. So I will just type GPT to call it. Now, when I do this, I will get a list of all the operators that are implemented in GPT and I can use them directly. So here are all my operators. For example, here you see the write operator um, and many others. So there is two ways to use GPT. You can either just type GPT and the name of the operator and input all the parameters. So let's say, for example, I want to um, write a product. And to find the help, I do dash H. And if I do this, I will get all the different options of how to use this operator and all the different settings. So here are how to set a source product. Here are how to set all the other parameters, such as, for example, the, uh, the format of the output file and so on. What you can also do is to take a graph and just simply say GPT and a path to the graph. I will not do that now and click enter and the graph will be processed. So if I now wanted to process this graph, I could simply pass the path to the graph here and click enter and the this graph would be processed with the exact input parameters that I have here. However, this would mean that it would only be processed for the single file that is set here. So what do I need to do? I need to change this parameter here to a variable that I can interactively change within GPT. To do this, I need to select the path to the file that is predefined here, only the path, and I delete it and I change it for dollar sign and name of a parameter. So the dollar sign signifies that this is a parameter and then I name my parameter input. Okay, then I need to do the same thing for the output file. You should be careful not to delete anything else than only the path of the file. And I will name my parameter output. You can name your parameters whatever you like, but you should remember the names as you will use them later to define the values for these parameters. Now, when I uh, changed um, this file. So I have to save it. So I will go to file, save as, 
and I will save it as step one graph prep. Okay, now I can close this file. And now how do I process this file? So uh, GPT actually does not have any batch processing capability and we need to have an additional script that runs GPT in bash. Now for this, you can use any scripting language. You can use Python, you can use R, you can use anything that you know. Um, in the end, it's very simple. Here I will be using simple shell script um, or in this case, bash script, which is the scripting language run by the Unix shell. Um, okay, so I will close this uh, terminal now and I will show you the shell script. I already built it, so uh, it is here in the code and I named it step one script gpt.sh and if I open it, it will open in the editable mousepad format and now I will just explain quickly what it does. So on line one, we specified that the script should be run with bash scripting language, that's right here. Then on line three, four and five, we specified our desired output folder path and the pattern beginning and ending our output name. So this is our output path. Here we have the um, pattern that we want to assign to the output. Um, so the name of the output uh, parameter and the, uh, the output file. So this is our output path where our outputs will be saved. In this script, we also have quite a lot of freedom on how to name our output file, unlike in Snap. So here, what we can do, we can um, assign the name. So here, I want my name for all of my outputs. Start with this pattern. So it says subset Sentinel2 and the type of product. And here, I want this to be the end of my name, of, the, of my uh, output name. So the line seven here signifies the start of the loop where the script will loop over all the files in the specified folder. So in this one that end with a specific pattern. In this case, we define the pattern as dot zip because all our files are zipped files. And in each loop, a new file from this folder will be assigned as I. Then on line eight and 13 in between the do and done, we enclose all the steps that should be performed on each input product. Now, in line nine, we extract the base name or the name of the input product without the path. And from that name here on line 10, we extract the acquisition date. And we use it then to define our output path um, to the product and output name. So here we set the parameter which is called output path name. And it consists of the output path folder, which we specified up here. Then it consists of the name start, which we have here, then the date. So it will be different for every input product. And then the name end, which is here. Now on line 12, we call the GPT and specify the path to our saved and edited graph file. So the graph file is saved here. And then with the dash P and variable name, we specify the parameters that are to be replaced in the graph file in each iteration. So you remember we created dollar sign input in the graph file. Now we just replaced with the dash P and input again, the name of the variable, and we assign the path to um, our input product as defined here in the beginning. And also the output, which here we define as the output path name, which we defined here. And then we close the loop. And once one product is processed, it will start on a new product again with the same parameters. So no, now how do we run this script? Basically, we can close it. And then from within the folder where the script is saved, we right click and we go to open terminal here. And we simply type sh to call the shell script. And then we type the name of the file. There we go. And now I could click enter and all my products 
or input products would be processed. I will not do it here because all my input products are already processed. Uh, this takes about approximately five minutes, so it's not very long, but there's no point to wait during this webinar. And let's have a look at the processed files. So I'll go back to Snap. And the nice thing about Snap is that if you need to load a lot of products and you need to show them repeatedly, you do not need to load them every time. You can save them as a session file. So I can now go to File, Session, Open Session, and preprocess Snap, which I saved previously. I will say no, I do not need to save. And now my session will be restored. Unfortunately, Snap at this point is not capable of saving the opened image images, only the loaded images. And now let's have a look at, for example, the one that we have looked uh, at previously. So that's the uh, 22nd of August. And I will right click and go to open RGB image. And I will open the natural colors and click OK. Now this is my subsetted and resampled image. So the next thing I can do, I could open all of these and as RGB for visual assessment of um, the watercolor. So let me do that quickly. So I have speeded this part up a little bit, but now I have all the images open in RGB view in natural colors, and I have displayed them side by side in order of time from April here to November here. To put them side by side, I have used the window and tile evenly option, and now we can evaluate them. Even by visual assessment, we can determine that the increase in biological production occurs throughout the summer and fall and decreases against to, again towards the colder months. However, to be able to quantify the concentration of phytoplankton and other substances, we need to process the data a bit farther. As mentioned previously, atmospheric correction is crucial in order to be able to separate different optically active constituents in water, such as chlorophyll A, TSM, sedum, phosphorus, and others. Number of different atmospheric correction algorithms exist for case 2 waters. However, here we will use the case 2 regional coast color processor. The processor is available in SNAP, but while it is available in SNAP graphical interface and in the command line, it is not available in the graph builder tool. We cannot therefore create a graph uh, in the GUI as we have done in the previous steps. However, we can use the GUI to create a parameter file, which we can then uh, use in combination with GPT and by script or Python or another scripting language as we have done previously. The C2RCC processor allows many different parameters to be set to accommodate more accurate atmospheric correction and extraction. And I'll show you how to do that in just a second. So first we will go to optical, thematic water processing, C2RCC, and S2MSI. This will open the processor menu. So in the front, uh, in the first uh, tab, which is the input output parameters tab, you can see the input file. This is automatically selected as the one as I have selected here and other input files. In this case, these are ozone interpolation start product, ozone interpolation end product, air pressure uh, start product and air pressure in end product. These are downloadable from a site you can find in the help. However, um, they do not really work well for S2 products as they resample the final product to the same resolution as they are, which is uh, one degree resolution, which of course it's much lower than we can uh, achieve with the Sentinel 2 product. So we will not use them and we will progress to the processing parameters. Now in the processing parameter tab, we can set following parameters, which is salinity. So of course we are looking at freshwater lake. However, value zero is not um, acceptable. So we have to put the lowest value that is possible. In this case, it's 0 0.001 and then elevation. The elevation, the mean elevation of the lake is 257 meters. The atmospheric parameters such as temperature, ozone and air pressure at sea level will be set in our bash script specifically for each image as they change in time. And all the other, other parameters that we have here, we will leave as default, including the thresholds and factors used for the TSM and chlorophyll A extraction. 
Finally, we will select the data that we wish to uh, include in the output, and we will select the output normalized water reflectances here, the output irradiance attenuation coefficients here, and the output uncertainties. So I can deselect the output atmospherically corrected angular dependent reflectances and the output door reflectances, which are uh, set by default, but we will not need them. So these are our three output data sets. Now um, I have these preset parameters and what I can do is I can go to File, Save Parameters and I will save them as C2 or CC Param and Save. Now these will be saved in the processing folder as an X, in an XML format, very similar to the graph, although only partially. So let's now have a look at the parameter file. So I can now close uh, my parameter um, setting here. I will also minimize snap and I will go to the processing folder. And here I have my parameters. So if I open them, I see that I have one node with all the parameters set as I have, um, as I have uh, defined them. Now I can close the file and now we will use another bash processing script to run the C2RCC algorithm on, our, on all our images and assign the respective water temperature, ozone and pressure values. So how do we do that? I already have the script prepared in the code uh, folder here. So let's go here, it's this one, and I will open it with mousepad. And you can see that while it's a little bit longer, it looks very similar as the first one that we have done. And the only difference is, is that we have, um, again, output folder, and we have also metadata file, uh, including the uh, auxiliary uh, atmospheric data of uh, temperature, ozone, and pressure, and also the parameter file that we have just exported from uh, snap um, graphical interface and then basically we are just uh, having a little bit more parameters setting here I will not go through this exactly step by step if you go back to the previous uh, Explanation of the previous bash script we used for the preprocessing uh, I'm sure you can understand this one very well as well alternatively you can go to um, the terminal emulator and type gpt c2rcc.msi dash h and you can see all the possible parameters that can be set this way. So this file is already set so I don't need to change anything and I will just quickly show you also the uh, auxiliary um, meteorological file which I have saved in aux data here. as a CSV file. And here we always have the date of the image and ozone in Dobson units, mean sea level uh, pressure and temperature. So these are our parameters and based on the date, we will always read them and replace them in our parameter file and in our processing for each image. So to run, I will go again to code because I have saved my script file here. I will right click, go to open terminal here. And again, type sh step this time two. There we go. And now I would click enter and all my files would be processed one by one. Again, I have already pre-processed the files before this webinar, so I will not go ahead with the processing. And I will just uh, close. But of course, if you were running it by yourself, you would have to wait now for processing. And I have my processed files now in this folder here. So now let's go back to Snap and investigate the results. I have created another session file with the results. So let's open it by going to File, Session, Open Session. Yes, we want to continue. And let's open the C2RCC process. Now, these are our, our, all our processed files. Let's investigate again the same file from the 22nd of August. 
And if I go to bands, now I have several folders here. So I have the inherent optical properties, concentrations, which include the concentrations, concentrations of uh, total suspended matter and chlorophyll. So let's open them. So first let's open chlorophyll concentration, also the TSM concentration, and also the uh, Galpstoff absorption coefficient. Now let's visualize them next to one another. So I'll go to window, or tile horizontally, then to navigation and zoom all. And then I will go to the color manipulation. So first let's click on the concentration of chlorophyll and color manipulation. And let's now uh, assign better color palette. So you can go to import color palette from text file. I click and I go to um, my, my AUX data where I have prepared the chlorophyll concentration color palette. And I do not want to stretch it between minimum and maximum as I want to keep the minimum and maximum values as predefined in the color palette. Then I will go to the TSM and do the same. And finally, to the absorption coefficient for Gelbstoff or sedum. And again, so now here I have all my color palettes, you could say legends, um, and in units. So for example, here I have absorption per meter of depth. Here concentrations are in um, grams on cubic meter and milligrams per cubic meter for chlorophyll. Now, apart from the chlorophyll A concentration, TSM concentration, and the other inherent optical properties extracted using the bio-optical model, we also have the normalized water leaving reflectances that are the output of the atmospheric correction. We have them for bands 1 to 6 and we can now use them to define our empirical models. Now, while many different band ratios and equations exist and we have discussed them previously, we have select selected two of them for this exercise. And the first one is the two band near infrared and red uh, band ratio model, which uses uh, bands 4 and 5 and also the maximum chlorophyll index or MCI, which uses bands 5, 4 and 6. And now we will use the band math operator to calculate these indices and then use the in situ data and simple linear regression to create our empirical models. Now, to create these band ratios, we will create another short graph. I have already created it, so I will just open it so I can show it to you. So first, let's go to Tools Graph Builder. And here we will load the graph. So I'll go to Load and Code and Step 3 Graph Band Math. And this is my little graph. So it only contains uh, the read operator and then two band math operators to calculate the uh, near infrared and red band ratio and to calculate the MCI and two write operators. So very simple. Now in the next step, we need to, of course, set the equations. Uh, they are already preset in this uh, graph that I have created up front. So I have named my target band for the uh, near infrared red ratio as following. And also I have changed the no data value to NAN. And my expression uses the valid pixel mask present in the C2RCC uh, data and it uses the bands, the normalized water leaving reflectances from bands 5 and bands 4. So I'm saying if the pixel is valid, then calculate this ratio, otherwise assign no data value. And I do exactly the same for the MCI. So here I name my band, output band MCI. I again set a no data value as NAN, and again, here I say if my pixel is valid, then calculate the MCI based on the equation you have already seen in the presentation. Otherwise, assign no data value. And in the output, at the moment, I do not need to um, apply anything. Now, because we want to process again all our 12 images, I need to use either batch processing in SNAP or I can use again the bash script and GPT as I have done previously. So now I have my graph. I can save it. OK, 
Okay, I have not changed anything. I can close the graph finally after I've saved it. And now let's go and see the graph. Because if you remember, we need to edit it. So let's open the graph in mousepad. There we go. So now uh, we need to do the same steps as we have done for the preprocessing graph. You remember that we replaced the input file by a parameter that was defined by dollar sign. So again, I will delete the path and I will write dollar sign input. And I have to do the same for the outputs. So now in this case, we actually have two outputs. So I have to differentiate between them to let the code know which is which. So I will delete again the path to the first one. But in this case, I have to be careful because this is actually the right operator too. They're not always in order as I have input them to the graph. So this one corresponds to band math too. So I will name it output two. And then here, this is the right operator. And I will name it output one. Now, when I have edited the file, I can just save it. And now I can process it with, again, my bash script that I have created previously. Let's just have a quick look in it. So it looks very similar as the preprocessing one that I have shown you, the one that we used for C2RCC calculation. It has two output folders, output one and output two, and it has two new ends. So again, because we are, of course, having two right operators for each of the band mouth operators, so for each of the new indices for the near infrared to red ratio model and for the MCI. And then, of course, it builds two output paths right here. And then it uses the graph that we have just created to process our data and replaces the parameters that we have created with the values created here in this file. So to run it, we would go back to our code folder, right click again, open terminal here, which opens the terminal right away in this path. And again, I would type sh. and the name of the script file. And I would click enter to process all my files. Again, I have pre-processed them previously, so I will not do so. So let me close this and let's have a look at the files. So they have been saved into the appropriate folders. At this point, let's go back to Snap to have a look at our results. We open another session file that I have prepared up front. So let's go to File, Session, Open Session. Click yes, and we will open the processed.snap. Now this will open three files. The first one is the C2RCC, the second one is the MCI, and the third one is the band ratio. They are all from the same date, from the 22nd of August. So now first let's compare them. First I will open the chlorophyll concentration from C2RCC. We have already seen this band. It also kept its visualization. Then I will go to the MCI and open the MCI band. And then I will go to the band ratio and again open the ratio band. Now again I will go to window and tile horizontally to see them next to one another. And finally, I'll go to the MCI and apply the same color palette as for the absolute chlorophyll concentration. So I will go to import color palette from file, use the chlorophyll concentration. In this case, however, I can't say no to uh, keep the minimum and maximum of the color palette because of course the values here are not the concentration values but only an index. So I say, yes, we want to stretch it based on the histogram of this file. And then I'll go to the band ratio here and do the same.
Now, of course, these don't look very much like the absolute concentration at all, but keep in mind that these are on the indices and not yet concentration measurements. Now, to define the empirical relationship between the indicators and the true values, we need to have the in-situ data. And in this exercise, the in-situ data have been acquired from the ARPA Umbria, or the Regional Environment Protection Agency of Umbria region in Italy. Now, you can find them if you go to the AUX data folder and in-situ data, and here is the original file, and also the polygons of the stations. Uh, I say polygons and not points, and this is because I have used a small polygon of 5x5 five five pixels to actually extract average value instead of single pixel value. Okay, I have used these polygons to extract the mean value of this small polygon in each of my images throughout the time series, and then create the model matching them with the in-situ data acquired on the closest date. I will not go into how to, to do this here in this exercise. You can use, for example, QGIS and the zonal statistics to perform this step, but I will show you the results. So let's go back to the presentation. Here we go. So in the table, you can see my uh, in-situ data. You can see that I have very few points. It's only four different times or days, acquisition days. And for each acquisition day, I have two points. These are represented by the station code here. So uh, here they are. And I have chlorophyll concentrations in milligram per cubic meter. And also the difference between the in-situ acquisition date and the image acquisition date. So you can see that, unfortunately, for the data that I have, the um, they do not always match perfectly with uh, my images. And some of them are as far as six days uh, apart. This, of course, brings additional uncertainty to my empirical model, and I can't really expect very good results. Now, as I mentioned, for each of my images that matches with in-situ data, I have um, extracted an average value from 5 by 5 pixel window for each station. And I have plotted them here. So here I have my chlorophyll concentration from in-situ data. And here I have the maximum chlorophyll index value, for example. If I then fit a simple linear trend line, I also get my uh, equation representing this line. And Y, of course, in this case, represents the chlorophyll value concentration values. And X represents the maximum chlorophyll index value here. And if I apply this equation to all my pixels in the MCI image, I can then recalculate them or estimate or recalculate uh, chlorophyll concentration in this way. Of course, as I mentioned, I do not have nearly enough points to make this um, empirical model uh, reliable. You can also see this by this R squared value here, which is the coefficient of determination, which tells us how well our indicator predicts uh, the actual concentration. Here we have very low R squared for both indicators, also for, uh, for the MCI and also for the band ratio, although here for the band ratio is, uh, it is a bit higher. Um, and uh, we can then assume that our empirical models will not perform very well. This is due to the fact that, as I mentioned, we have very few in-situ data samples, and moreover, they were not taken on the same day, and chlorophyll values change dynamically in time, and longer periods between in-situ uh, measurements and image date uh, acquisition will result in a lot, of, uh, a lot of decorrelation and introduce uncertainties into our model. However, um, I use them here in order to demonstrate the method, and we could now use exactly the same bunt math expression graph as we have used to calculate these indices, only updating the equation uh, to this equation, where x, of course, is the um, equation representing the um, maximum chlorophyll index, or in this case, the band ratio. And in this way, we would uh, receive the chlorophyll concentrations, the estimated chlorophyll concentrations in milligram per cubic meter. Uh, I will not show this here. Um, the method is the same as you have used before, and I will only show you the results. 
So first, let's have a look at our chlorophyll concentration as derived by the uh, C2RCC, which employs a bio-optical model, so a bit more sophisticated method. So this is our concentration. Uh, again, starting here in April, and here the last image is from uh, November. We see that we have some contamination by cirrus clouds and so on. That's, for example, this area here, and also most likely here. Now let's have a look at the maximum chlorophyll index. So again, the results are in the same order, but the values we can see are a bit different. Uh, this is due to the fact that uh, while that our fitted line or fitted model is not exactly well calibrated for low values, and in that respect, we basically don't see any values close to the zero, which um, is highly unlikely in this case. So we have bias toward higher values. For the ratio model, uh, the situation is a little bit better. Um, but uh, again, we would need uh, further validation to see how well our empirical model has, has performed. And again, since we only have eight actual in-situ points from which we derive the model, um, we can expect that the results are not going to be, in fact, uh, very precise. So this is to conclude this exercise. I realized that the last part um, is a little bit vague, but this is due to the fact that unfortunately it is not easy to acquire uh, in-situ data um, from the different uh, research organizations. But if you have access to any in-situ data, you can easily perform this same analysis with much better results for your study area. So to summarize, first uh, we learned during this exercise that Roost services provide free cloud computing environment in the form of virtual machines, and you can use them to overcome any issues that you have with processing Sentinel data regarding to uh, processing capacity, storage capacity, and knowledge. And also uh, we have learned that combining temporal resolution of a Sentinel-2 data with in-situ measurements, we can uh, monitor spatial and temporal variations in water quality using space-borne data and significantly lower the um, amount of necessary sampling, in-situ sampling, and actually increase frequency of monitoring that we can do. Now on the next slide here, I put the references and links that I have used for this tutorial. You can find uh, many much more information here about the different empirical models and about the theory of uh, freshwater quality monitoring using Sentinel data and um, space-borne uh, sensors. Finally, if you wish to uh, repeat this webinar, you can uh, request a virtual machine on our rus-copernicus.eu website. Or if you already have the machine, you can then go to your dashboard and request the webinar tutorial kit with the code of HIDER02. And if you wish to learn more about our future webinars or face-to-face -face trainings, you can follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or Facebook. And of course, as mentioned previously, the whole tutorial is being recorded and will be available on YouTube in a matter of few days. Thank you very much for uh, listening and I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new and I'll see you next time.